Hi there, my name is Zach Johnson and I'm instructor here at Garnish, the Garnish Music Production School. Today I'm going to be giving you an introduction to Ableton Live and giving you an overview of Ableton Live. Uh, this is actually a way for students or anyone who's curious about what we do here at Garnish Music Production School. And if you're interested in, in signing up for a course or looking into uh, any of the available courses that we have here at Garnish, this is kind of a way to give you a sneak peek or more of a uh, preview of what to expect in a Garnish course. Yeah, if you turn your attention here, what you're looking at right now currently is Ableton Live. So uh, if you haven't downloaded Ableton Live yet, please uh, definitely uh, do that if you can. You can always go to ableton.com to learn more about the different options uh, or different packages that, that come with a, the, the actual live software. So what I'd like to do, how I'd like to start this course, primarily I'd like to go over uh, what's happening here under the hood, things that are important to know about Ableton Live, um, some basic things here like, for example, about Live. This will actually tell you the current version that you are working on, and this will tell me the, uh, the version that I'm using um, and it will give a list of the authors as well. Um, so under this area here, let me go ahead and click out of this. I go back to preferences and this is actually a really important area for you to understand. Um, just some things I would like to point out here that are um, good to know when you're first starting out in Ableton. And the first tab in the preferences is look and feel. So in here you'll find the language. Um, here you'll find zoom display. So if you want to change the actual display of your zoom zooming in and out this is a great or uh, this is where you would uh, turn your attention to on that um, assigning track colors uh, clip colors you can actually have it automatically or randomly select colors for you this is where you can find the theme so if you actually wanted to change uh, the the actual colorway of the template in Ableton you can do that here um, brightness, color intensity, and color hue as well. Under here, this is a very important tab. This is the, the audio tab. This is where you're gonna find your driver type, regardless if you're on a PC or Macintosh computer. This is where you're gonna find your core audio, um, your audio input devices and audio output devices. So if any of you are working with a sound interface, this is where you'd wanna turn your attention to if you plan on using, say, a microphone, or if you're gonna record or track instruments, this drop down menu here, if you actually have an interface connected, this is where you would find that information. Um, you can see here I have multiple choices. This is referring to the built in output of my Macintosh computer. Uh, down here, I have my Universal Audio Thunderbolt interface. Uh, depending on the make and model of your unit, this is where you would find that information, okay? Um, sample rate, sample rate. Uh, this is uh, where you can find that information. Buffer size for um, if you are working with any sort of latency issues. This is where you can actually adjust your buffer size and you can actually uh, do a test tone if you want to see how your CPU uh, audio engine is, is performing or with your interface. Under here, the link and MIDI tab, this is where you would find your control services. So if you're gonna use a uh, external MIDI device, hardware device, this is where you would find that information. And as you can see here under the control surface, there's a list of all these different makes and models of different uh, MIDI controllers to hardware, um, uh, hardware 16 pads, like something maybe like uh, Native Instruments Machine, the Akai series, um, and in this case, you can see mine said, says complete control because I'm using Native Instruments complete control uh, A series keyboard. Okay, moving on here, uh, file folder. This is an important area. So if you wanted to save a template, custom template, um, over time, you might want to start building up your own templates depending on if you're tracking vocals or if you're just making drum beats. Um, you can actually save multiple different types of templates and right here is where you do that. Okay. You can also find your, your cache area here and uh, your, uh, information about the Max application itself. 
Under here in the library, this is an important area for any of you who own the Ableton Suite package or even the standard package. Uh, when you download all the packs, this is actually going to tell you exactly where the installation folder packs is located. And if you'd like to customize this, meaning if you want your third party sample packs stored on an external hard drive, in this case, that's what I did. Uh, you could simply click where it says installation folder for packs, browse, and you can relocate um, uh, your, your packs that you've downloaded from Ableton's website or when you purchase the full suite, um, you can have these organized in a separate custom folder. Okay, um, moving on from the library tab, plugins, okay? This is an important area. So if you plan on using any sort of third-party VST or plugin, third-party meaning that's not native to, in, to Ableton Live, um, this is an important area. If you want those plugins to show up in your browser tab, uh, for those of you who are on Macintosh, um, you might want to check out use uh, selecting audio units if you want them to show up. VST2 plugin system folder for both Windows and Macintosh, and then uh, VST3 plugin system folder, you would want these on. If for some reason you've downloaded a new third party instrument um, and it's not showing up in your plugins browser section, which I'm going to be demonstrating here in a moment, um, you could also set uh, to rescan plugins so um, Ableton will then uh, read through all of your available plugins and and and, and sometimes this is a, is a way to to make sure that uh, they, they will show up and display properly in uh, the category section under plugins okay um, moving on record warp launch this area this is where you can find the, the recording type if you want to select either a wave or an AIFF uh, uncompressed lossless file type. Your bit depth settings are here. Count in settings, this is for if you plan on recording and you want a count of say one bar before the recording actually um, starts, this is where you would find these settings. And actually there's another place you could do this that I'll show you a little bit later. Um, but I like personally, I like to set it to one bar, um, especially if I'm working with vocalists, you get a nice count of one, two, three, four and begin. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a really nice feature. Okay. Um, down here, loop warp short samples. Uh, this is where if you plan on having Ableton assist you in warping and quantizing and actually detecting the BPM value of your, uh, samples, um, you would probably want to take advantage of this technology that Ableton's implemented. And then down here where it says auto warp long samples. I'm going to go ahead and turn that on um, below that default warp mode. Now by default, it's set to beats mode. Um, you can leave it in beats mode. That's completely fine. But I recommend putting it in complex mode. Complex is a different type of algorithm that can uh, Ableton will essentially the live software will um, uh, it, it's a little bit more comp not to use the term complex, but the algorithm is actually a little bit more high quality when it comes to detecting more complex audio waveforms. By complex audio waveforms, what do I mean? I'm talking about anything that has maybe more than one layer of sound. So maybe not necessarily just a drum loop, but if that drum loop has a bass uh, uh, line underneath it, or if it has uh, harmony like chords, or melody, vocals, um, you know, this is definitely something I recommend that you have your default warp mode set to. You can always switch it back to these different warp modes. I'll be talking about this later on as we look a little bit more in depth into audio. Okay. Uh, create fades on clips edges. Okay. So this by default can create fades on your clip edges. I recommend that you turn that off because there might be some situations where you don't want a fade on a certain element, um, for example, like drums. Maybe I don't want fade on my kick drum or my snare. That's something that um, you might want to to consider or reconsider if you are uh, if yeah if you are um, trying to have your drum smack or try to hit hard. <laughs> okay, um, down here again. This is an important area: the license and maintenance. Um, I recommend get automatic updates, have that turned on. So anytime you restart Ableton or when you first turn it back on, as long as you have an internet connection, you'll uh, Ableton will automatically give you those updates in the background. 
and send usage data, I recommend that you leave that on as well. It actually helps Ableton engineers, um, especially if there's any bug reports or um, you know information that they can learn from depending on what kind of computer you're using or what software you're using um, along with Ableton, like third party um, things. It's just, it's, it's actually very beneficial um, for the engineers at Ableton. So I recommend leaving that on. It helps everybody in the end, so yeah. Okay, so that's just a quick overview of the Ableton preferences. You might want to note that, of course, I didn't go into the nitty gritty of every single detail. If you were to actually take the Ableton course, um, which is definitely a live course that we host, it's definitely more interactive and um, we definitely go through every single aspect to this, but because this is a one hour live um, presentation, there's only so much I can cover in one hour. And if you're curious about our classes, again, uh, they range between three hours to six hour courses with, of course, with breaks in between um, um, uh, some of those segments. But anyways, let's keep moving on here. Um, so after live in the file section, this is where you can create new, um, new sets. You can open up old sets. If you need to install packs, if you need to uh, save your sets, or if you want to export your video and audio. So once you actually make a song, if you want to export something, this is where you're going to find that information under file. And then this is an important area, manage files. Okay. If you look over here, uh, managing the current set or managing the project, sometimes you actually need to get inside the user library, um, especially if files come up missing in your project, um, which I'll tell you that's something you definitely want to avoid. And, and, and I'll give you examples of that a little bit later. But um, yeah, the managing files section is, is a good place to see exactly where your uh, current files are stored and where your um, temp files might be stored as well. Okay, the edit section, the create section, the view section, all of these things here, uh, we're gonna dive into a little bit more when we look at the layout. But um, everything that you find here when it comes to editing audio, uh, duplicating audio, manipulating, modulating audio, things like that in that nature all lie under here with, with edit and create and view. Um, under options, again, there's um, some good things in here when it comes to um, if you want to edit uh, your MIDI mapping or edit your key mapping or edit your MIDI keyboard, if you want to actually use your keyboard as, uh, as a MIDI device. Under here, delay compensation, uh, reduce latency with monitoring. These are good tools if you run into any sort of latency issues. And then finally, the help section. Yes, you can actually um, uh, read the, the live manual. So once you actually download the full suite, you could click right on read the live manual and the live manual will pop up on your screen. So <laughs> what's better than uh, you know fielding your questions to the live manual? So if you ever have issues, or if you have questions about something, you could always refer to that. And then right here, you can visit the Ableton website. You can look at your user account and licenses, and you can also check for updates just in case maybe uh, you forgot to check off the check updates. You can always refer to it here as well, okay? All right.